My name is Mark Peruskin. I'm the CEO of uh, Berry Street. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm here in Melbourne. I know that we have people dialing in from as far as Western Australia, um, but right across the Eastern Seaboard, as well as close to me, as I said, here in Melbourne, and we all have our lands on uh, different ab Aboriginal countries. Welcome to the launch of the report, Keeping Families Together During COVID, the strengthened case for early intervention. This report builds on a report that was released late last year in November, uh, the economic case for early intervention. That report highlighted the significant increase in the numbers of kids going into care here in Victoria, uh, and importantly, what early intervention could do to both reduce those numbers and save uh, government money. We know that COVID is having a disproportionate impact on the children and families who are already facing adversity and keeping families together during COVID was commissioned by Berry Street and commissioned by the uh, Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare in order to better understand the impact that COVID may have on children and families in contact with child protection in Victoria. And most importantly, what we wanted to do was understand what was required to address the increase in expected demand, given that the existing system was already ill-equipped to, to deal with the demands already on it. In order to bring this report to life, we will hear from Susie King. Uh, Susie um, is from Social Ventures Australia. We'll then have a panel discussion, which includes um, the Professor Muriel Bamblett, AO, the CEO of VACA, uh, Caitlin, a lived experience consultant from Berry Street, as well as Deb Savaris, the CEO of the Centre for, for Excellence. We're going to do it all in 45 minutes, so it's going to be short, sharp uh, and informative. And I would encourage you to use either the chat function or the Q&A function that is at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many of those as, as possible. Uh, you may have heard an announcement that this event is being recorded. So we had about 500 people register for the, the event. We're getting up close to 300. So we expect over the next few minutes to, uh, to get even more people on. So in order for those who couldn't uh, register uh, because it was full, uh, we want to record the event and um, provide them with the opportunity to see it. I'd now like to invite Anna from the Macquarie Group Foundation to, well, I guess, the virtual stage uh, to introduce uh, Susie King. The Macquarie Group Foundation funded this report that we're launching today. They also funded the previous one and really want to acknowledge their support in making this happen and for their interest in our work. I'll hand over to you, uh, Anna. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just provide some really quick background as to why uh, the Macquarie Group Foundation did want to fund this really important report, both back in September, uh, well, la uh, end of last year, and, uh, and also this, this more recent version. You know, we felt it was a really important piece to, um, uh, to, 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 to understand more about what the evidence is around early intervention in, in at-risk families. And obviously, it's a little bit different to what we normally fund because uh, our philanthropic's um, objective is more around kind of young people aged 15 to 24. But obviously, there's a, there's a very clear adjacency between the work that's being done um, uh, you know, with, 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 uh, with early stage, early intervention, um, younger children, uh, and and the downstream effects that that work can have um, for for children when they grow up to be young people, and obviously their interactions with with government services, um, health and justice, <clears throat> those kinds of things. We really want to minimise that. Um, so we we felt really strongly that that funding this report could support respected experts, many of whom are on this call today. Um, so it would help the 
them undertake more, more active advocacy, you know, leverage um, conversations with, with relevant decision makers and anything that Macquarie could do to kind of progress those conversations would be valuable. Um, obviously, struggling families, um, you know, don't go away in a pandemic. So actually, we need to double down um, on, our, on our support and, and funding SVA, who uh, Macquarie is, uh, you know, very familiar with over many, many years of funding other projects. And um, we knew that they would do a report of the highest quality. Um, and so we were pleased to contribute further support for this, this updated version um, uh, two or three months ago. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading the report. I do hope it presents the government with a very compelling case about how greater investment in early intervention um, is a no-brainer, effectively. Um, and I'd like to really thank Berry Street, the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare and VACA for progressing this agenda. Um, so I'll hand to Susie King to present on the, the key findings of the report. Um, as Michael mentioned, she was with um, SVA. Uh, she's a strategy consultant with more than 20 years experience locally and overseas across the public, private and social sectors. Uh, her work spans business planning, service design, scaling. She leads SVA's anti-violence um, family practice and she also has deep knowledge and relationships across the mental health, child and family services and tropics so are clearly um, perfectly positioned to, um, to, to talk to us through more about what she's found. And along with her colleague, Nancy Tran, she's led the development of this research. So thank you, Susie, over to you. Thanks very much, Anna. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I joined, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, uh, including the young people and children, many of whom who are at the center of this research. It's my pleasure to share the findings of the recent research we conducted on behalf of Berry Street and the Centre to understand the current and potential impact of COVID-19 on the economic case for early intervention in the child protection and out of home care system in Victoria. This research was very much a team effort and I acknowledge the leadership of my colleague, Nancy Tran, a principal in our Melbourne office and contributions of Julia Loudon, a consultant in our Perth team who are also joining us today. For context, the number of children in out-of-home care in Victoria is growing, with close to almost 1% of all Victorian children in care in 2018-2019. As shown in this chart, if the proportion of children in care continues to grow at this rate per year, the number of children in care would almost double to nearly 23,000 by 2026. Within this cohort, the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children would rise further. 26% of children in out-of-home care identify as Aboriginal in 2018, representing 11% of the population of children aged zero to 17. The proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care continues to grow at a rate of 15% per year. At the end of last year, SBA conducted a cost-benefit analysis to understand the case for early intervention in the child protection and out-of-home care system in Victoria. We did this by modelling the net savings for a percentage of children supported each year for 10 years through five evidence-based early intervention programs, which are proven to reduce the likelihood of children entering out-of-home care. This research showed that an additional investment of 150 million per year for 10 years in targeted early intervention programs would support up to 1,200 children to avoid entering out-of-home care per year, improving their lifelong social outcomes. It would also deliver cumulative net savings of 1.6 billion to the child protection and out of home care system in Victoria over this period. Our recent research, which I'll work through today, is focused on trying to understand the emerging and potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Victorian families experiencing vulnerability, and in particular, the case for investment in early intervention. It won't surprise you that this research further strengthens the case. The rapidly changing and uncertain nature of the pandemic meant we had to be thoughtful about the methodology for the work, in particular, how to understand the impact of emerging indicators on child abuse and neglect in the absence of any official data, as well as understanding the potential future impact. Given this, we designed a four-step approach. We identified the risk factors of child abuse and neglect based on current, the current evidence base, including work done by the Institute for Family Studies. From there, we assessed the evidence of the emerging effects of COVID-19 on these risk factors, including reported indicators, 
and research from previous economic shocks and other jurisdictions on the impacts of child abuse on child abuse and neglect. Given the high levels of uncertainty about how the COVID-19 pandemic will play out, we developed the future scenarios on the potential impact on vulnerable families and children and the increase in demand for child protection. These scenarios were based on an amalgam of health and economic scenarios developed by other analysts, but extrapolated by us for the impacts on vulnerable families, support services, and specifically the demand for child protection and out-of-home care. Finally, we ran the cost-benefit model for each scenario to understand the increased economic and other benefits from the investment in early intervention. The significant social and environmental impacts felt by all Victorians from the pandemic, include increased isolation, stress, poorer mental health, loss of employment, and loss of access to social supports. These and other impacts of COVID-19 are known risk factors of child abuse and neglect. This graphic shows in concentric circles the relationship between the social and environmental impacts of the pandemic, the impacts on family risk factors for child abuse and neglect, and the impacts on individual child risk factors. Specifically, under social and environmental impacts, the uncertainty in the labour market, an economic recovery, and increased housing stress. In terms of impacts on families, uh, risk factors of child abuse and neglect include family violence, parental substance abuse, and increased social isolation. The impacts on child risk factors, such as intensified challenging behaviour, we then use these risk factors to understand the impact of emerging indicators of COVID-19. There are strong indicators that COVID-19 has already increased many of the risk factors of child abuse and neglect. These indicators on this slide are just a snapshot of the many reported indicators to date, but provide insight into the potential impact of the pandemic on these risk factors. The incomes of 35% of working age Australians have declined due to COVID-19 and 1 million have lost their jobs with women and children hardest, hardest hit. A study by Monash University showed that 50% of practitioners surveyed have observed an increase in the frequency and severity of family violence. Other indicators include a 100% increase in calls to Lifeline, households reporting purchasing more alcohol with a concern about consumption, Calls to VACA in relation to escalations in family violence tripled and the number of Australians who couldn't pay their rent more than doubled. These examples and the other indicators set out in our report, as well as those reported on almost a daily basis in Victoria, provide insight into the emerging impact of COVID-19 on risk factors for vulnerable children and families. We modelled three scenarios to understand the potential different possibilities relating to the key uncertainties of the COVID-19 recovery. These uncertainties include the trajectory of the pandemic, the shape of the economic recovery and the success of governmental and societal actions to influence these paths. These scenarios set out on this page were based on the work of other analysts such as the RBA, Deloitte Access Economics and the Grattan Institute. We extrapolated these scenarios to understand the impact on support services, on vulnerable families, and on the demand for child protection and out-of-home care. Our experience in Victoria recently with the implementation of stage four restrictions is a good example of the value of scenarios to help frame the uncertainty of the pandemic. For example, in the mid scenario in this table, noted as medium in orange, the projection is for a more prolonged health impact with ongoing restrictions to manage outbreaks not dissimilar to what we're experiencing in Victoria at present, and slower economic recovery until a vaccine is available. For services, this is my, most likely to mean patchy, re patchy resumption, and for vulnerable families, sustained unemployment, ongoing isolation, and children struggling to stay connected with schools closed. As a result, our assumptions in this scenario are that demand for child protection rises by 10% for three years, and 25,000 children are in out-of-home care by 2026, growing at a rate faster than the current projections I outlined earlier. Of course, if we experience a better case or a more severe scenario, demand could be as low as a 5% increase over two years or as high as a 20% increase over five years, with up to 25,000, sorry, up to 27,500 in out-of-home care by 2026. 
So what does that mean for the case for investment in early intervention? This graph shows the economic benefits of investment in early intervention under all three scenarios over a 10 year period. All three scenarios break even during the fifth year of investment. That is the cost of the annual investment in the programs is equal to the savings achieved across the system by the end of the fifth year. If we take the mid case scenario in orange, a $183 million additional investment per year over 10 years in evidence-based programs for about 8,400 children would deliver a cumulative net saving of 1.83 billion to the child protection and out-of-home care system in Victoria over this period. I think this graph tells a really compelling story that the projected increase in demand from COVID-19 under all scenarios further strengthens the case for early intervention in um, evidence-based programs. Importantly, this investment also delivers significantly better outcomes for vulnerable children and families. This table, in addition to showing for each modelled scenario, the size of the additional investment over 10 years and the cumulative net savings to the child protection and out of home care system, also shows the improved outcomes for children and families. Specifically, the number of children and families supported by evidence-based programs and the number of children who would avoid out-of-home care as a result of this investment in early intervention. In the mid-case scenario, over 1,300 children per year would avoid out-of-home care. We know many children in out-of-home care experience significantly poorer outcomes than children who do not. By avoiding out-of-home care, they also are likely to experience greater engagement with education, training and employment, decreased risk of engagement with the youth justice system, decreased risk of homelessness and decreased risk of mental health and other problematic drug and alcohol usage. The savings to these systems are not captured in this cost benefit analysis. This research shows the significant impact that additional investment in targeted early intervention can deliver to Victorian children and families experiencing vulnerability in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. As noted in our report, this investment must sit alongside and in addition to ongoing investment in reforms aimed at strengthening the foundations and addressing gaps in the system, including family services, kinship care and leaving care supports. These reforms must also strengthen efforts to address the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children in out-of-home care as a result of continued institutional racism and perpetuating the intergenerational trauma of child removal. Thanks very much. But, so thanks, Susie, for that uh, really concise overview. I'll just wait for the screen to come back um, onto me. I'm trying to work out whether Okay, I so thanks very much, Susie. Really appreciate that um, clear and concise overview, as I said, and I want to commend both Susie and Nancy for the work they did on the report, and they're an absolute uh, pleasure to uh, to work with um, uh, now for this second time. Uh, before we get to the panel, there's, there's just a few, I think, key takeouts from Susie's presentation that, are, that I want to run through. I think the first one is, as I sit here in Melbourne, we're, we're in a strict lockdown. We're in, lo in uh, stage four lockdown, and what we're hearing about the impact on the economy suggests very strongly that we are looking to that third scenario, the severe impact scenario, uh, and, and looking at an extra 4,500 kids in care at least. I think we can safely say we're in a severe uh, scenario. I think the second thing is we're on track to have 27,500 kids in care uh, here in Victoria, which is a shocking uh, statistic. And that's by 2026, that's six short years away. Uh, and it's going to have significant impacts on service systems right across um, the, uh, the, the services that we, that we work with. I think the, the stat that, um, uh, that Susie went through in terms of Aboriginal children, so 26% 20, of kids in care in Victoria, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. I want to compare that to uh, the fact that they are 1% of 
of the population. That's racism. If the Black Lives Matter movement has taught us anything, that is evidence of racism. And the final point is keeping families together and doing it through early intervention is profitable. Uh, you know, you're getting a government would be getting a two billion dollar return, essentially doubling their investment over the ten year period. And I think, uh, you know, Macquarie funded this work, and I, I'd go so far as to say that sort of return would make an investment banker's eyes water. Uh, never mind our our treasurer. So the the returns are there if it's um, done well. I'd now like to move into the discussion with our our panel. So I'd like to invite, once again, to the virtual screen, uh, Professor Muriel Bamblett, uh, AO. Uh, Muriel, as I said, is the CEO of VACA and expert in Aboriginal child welfare for many years. We've got uh, Caitlin. Caitlin is the experience consultant and has deep expertise in service system through her lived experience, but also in um, through advocacy work that she has done. And finally, we've got Deb Savaris, the CEO of the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare. So welcome to all our panellists. Now, I just want to make sure we've got everyone on screen. I'm just waiting for Muriel. Muriel's on screen. Okay, so Muriel, I want to go first to you if I, I could, and the, I'd like to, to, to start the discussion um, with how COVID has impacted Aboriginal peoples and how this, uh, has, uh, how this has compounded the existing impacts of institutional racism, which um, have been highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement and um, as I mentioned before, Mira. Yeah, I guess, um, and I want to too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land wherever we are, and um, my people are Yorta Yorta and Jar Jar Rung. Um, and I really wanted to, uh, um, you know, thank you for the invitation today. I think we know that, and you mentioned that we're in a state of disaster in Victoria, and Metropolitan Melbourne is now under stage four restrictions, but the impact of COVID. For, for Aboriginal people is ongoing and complex, and we know that. Um, but it, the real issue is it's compounded by structural inequity equity and institutional racism that brings so many of our people before us and come into contact, particularly with justice systems, with child protection systems, family violence systems. So up until the second wave of community transmission, we had very few numbers in Victoria, but those numbers are now going through the roof. We're now seeing it within our workforce, within our clients, and mostly within the vulnerable suburbs. So that, that's what's really alarming. But I've been really proud to be a part of the Aboriginal sector where we've um, seen a lot of collaborative work. We've seen adaptive and innovative response to community needs. And this is due really to the leadership across the Aboriginal community in Victoria. The focus also has been around mostly around well-being, safety management, communication, resource and food support. We've also put a great focus on our elders because we know the value of that in our community. We've also had to adapt our program and service and practice orientation in response to our community needs. The greatest strength of our Aboriginal community controlled organisations is they act as a community hub and so they've been delivering food. They also, at this moment, um, they deliver health, housing, aged care, drug and alcohol, family services, family violence, legal and justice. So you can see that they have the capacity to hold families. We've also, under COVID, been able to broaden our response and strategic response and work with government. And so we've set up in Victoria a COVID task force, plan, monitor, do risk, um, undertake risk management, communication and community engagement. And I think that's been critical. We have informed the machinery of government to sure, ensure there's a multi-sectoral because Aboriginal families are involved in institutional and, and, and systems across family violence, justice. And some of those are really critical to how do we actually engage Aboriginal families. So um, we've created as well and done a lot of work around community activation. Um, 
We've also been able to address system vulnerabilities in education, homelessness, justice, family violence, um, and child protection, which is needed. But I think you've alluded to one of the things, Michael, and that is the, that many of the systems and institutions that Aboriginal people are represented in are biased to non-Aboriginal and tend to reflect the dominant discourses of power and in responses to and outcomes for our people. Our role, I believe, is everybody's role is to intervene earlier. And we do need to address racial disparity and the substance disproportionality of Aboriginal people before our welfare and justice systems. We can't do this unless we understand unconscious bias and have conversations about racism. And when I speak about racism, I don't want people to think of racism as a personal prejudice or out of hate. I think people see the word racism and think it's based on hate. I believe it is multifaceted problem and I think that it's prevalent across all our systems. But we can't avoid the topics that create discomfort. We can create just and equitable systems, but I think we need to commit to increasing critical consciousness. I think we need to face personal discomfort and support anti-racism. Then real change can permeate our systems. And I think that we can do that together. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Muriel. Um, I'm gonna come back to you in a moment if I can. I wanna to move to to Caitlin now. Um, Caitlin, I'll just wait for Caitlin to get onto the to the screen. Hi Michael, how are you? Hey. Can you see me? Hi Caitlin. Um, Hi. Thanks so much for being with us today and allowing no us to share your, your wisdom um, in terms of lived experience. What would a stronger focus on early intervention have meant for you? Mm, um, it's a good point. Um, I've actually written, written a few themes about that, um, um, so bear with me. Um, so first of all, it's um, undeniably a broken system. Um, for me and for most people, having to navigate systems, any system, whether it be mental health, residential care, um, is that it's meant to benefit our lives, but at the same time, they can often be frustratingly rigid relentless and often confusing mazes. Um, and it's up to the young people to find out where they have to go rather than services telling them where they need to go and what can benefit them. Um, and we can no longer keep relying on the fact that this is a system that works. Um, I think we can all agree, given the statistics that have come out of this report. Um, and as I'm sitting here with you all today, appearing to be a particularly articulate and probably perhaps confident young person, I'm still um, struggling with the effects of living in the out-of-home care system. And it's, it's, it's difficult, um, even long after it was you know, directly affecting me, it still continues to have those long effects um, on me and my siblings. Um, and um, I think the next one would be um, partnerships. So partnering, we all need to do our job in working together that to do right by the vulnerable children that come into our care. Um, it needs to be less of a competition about who gets funding and more of a realization that we're all stronger when we work together. Um, we also must be partnering and co-designing with young people who have the relevant lived experiences in order for us to see significant and meaningful change. Um, and we can't possibly seek to find the answers without including these young people into the development and co-design of these systems if we wanna see change. Um, and accountability. Um, we also owe it to our future, our young people, to be setting an example and leading the way as organizations who take charge in looking after these children. Um, everyone has to do, be doing their part. And if we want the children and young people that are in our care to have a chance and to live long futures, we need to be doing that. So that's, that's what I have to say about that. Sorry there, Caitlin, I was mucking around with my, um, my mute button. Uh, thank you so much for those insights. And I think more powerful because of the lived experience that, that sits um, behind it. And I love the point around accountability. I think that applies very much to organisations like Berry Street, as well as the um, child protection system uh, run by, by government. Uh, fantastic, thank you. I wanna go back to Muriel just for a second. What has early intervention 
look like for Aboriginal peoples, Mira? I think it's really important, um, early intervention, and I mean, if you look at all of the data, a lot of Aboriginal people don't believe that, um, or have the view that family services aren't there to support them. And so I think we have to change the way we look at early intervention because Aboriginal people have always felt that to go and have to access, you have to access a family service. And I think it's critical to change that, that thinking. But I think every element of an early intervention and prevention approach has to have a cultural lens over it. And so it's important that Aboriginal people um, can see their culture in, reflected in any approach that we have. Our early intervention models need to be developed and led by Aboriginal people, but they need to also be trauma-informed and culturally based, and that they respect Aboriginal knowledge and wisdom and be grounded in the principle of self-determination. I think evidence-based, evidence-based learning is a lot of the, um, today is a lot of the language, but unless we understand Aboriginal practice frameworks and understand Aboriginal therapeutic and the ways that Aboriginal people use music, dance, song and ceremony as part of their approach to healing. But I think it's really important that we have flexible and adaptive programs that meet the needs of our families. And I think commitment to flexible long-term funding is a critical element. Too many of a, too much funding at the moment is for short um, episodic funding, not long term. So um, I think it's critical. Aboriginal people um, have a right to a service system, and I think the way that child protection is, it's not aimed at, you know, delivering on the rights of people and delivering for, you know, against the overrepresentation. Thank Thanks, you. Mira. I, I think. Um... You know, it goes back to a point that, that you made in your, your first answer in terms of, uh, you know, the last thing I think Aboriginal communities need is for, um, uh, you know, for white privilege to come in to guide the answer about what is the best approach for Aboriginal organisations and Aboriginal peoples. And what I hear you saying very uh, loud and, and very strongly, and I've heard you say it before, is that Self-determination self needs to drive the early intervention response, and that's the only way it's um, going to be effective. Thank you for that. Okay. I, I want to move to Deb Sabaris now. Deb, so the report identifies, it emphasises the opportunity for significant reform through early intervention. Besides the significant investment, and I might say the significant returns as well. Um, Deb, what do you think needs to happen in order to create the environment for it to be successful? Thank you, thank you, Michael. And it's um, it's a pleasure working with you, uh, with Caitlin and um, the young people at Why Change, um, and Muriel. Um, it's just um, I'm pinching myself being here today. This is a this is a landmark report. This is uh, this is going to tell a story that we're going to uh, be able to use for some time. So I want to thank you. I also want to acknowledge the land on which we're meeting today and Aboriginal peoples around the country, uh, and our emerging Aboriginal leadership um, here in Victoria. Um, so um, I've got a bit to say. So I'll go for it. Uh, so Victoria's Child and Family Service System must be about families and children thriving, not just surviving. Uh, which I think Caitlin was saying in her incredible words, it's a game of survival. And that is appalling. And even more so today in the stage four restrictions, I guess, uh, in family homes today, there'll be things happening that um, where we should be supporting families. It's a bit of a scary time. So this means that our system, if we want to call it, which is a system, uh, which is a problem, even the name system's a problem, needs to have a bunch of what I would call complementary parts. It must have a robust family services support approach and a platform. It has to be about self-determination and being culturally appropriate. It has to use evidence. You know, it's a battleground, the evidence battleground, but it has to be evidence informed. We have to, have to, have to support the development of Aboriginal practice. And we need a, a child protection system that actually protects and keeps children safe. Um, 
so currently there isn't really a real acknowledgement um, and a preparedness for these kinds of reforms. To be honest, all of it's coming from within the sector mostly. We've got some support from within government, but ultimately this is a sector driven piece of work. And uh, if you look at the report closely, there's lots of big names on that report uh, in supporting uh, uh, this piece of work. So we need a revolution not just a reorientation, not just a readjustment, we need big change. Um, we currently don't have what I would believe is a strong culture uh, across our child protection systems that empowers young people and families to thrive, not just survive. In fact, the data is appalling. Uh, just if you look at the data in relation to health and education outcomes for children who've been in care, they are miserable bits of data. Uh, and young people uh, get, get, get ahead in spite of that, rather than um, the support that we should be giving them. For all of us, whether you're a child protection worker, a family services worker, or you're working in out-of-home care, it can be demoralising on some days, um, exciting on others if you've been able to get what you need for a child. That shouldn't be the case. From our perspective at the centre, reform won't be successful without significant cultural change where we accept the realities of some of the things that both uh, my colleagues, Muriel and Michael spoke about, um, and specifically listening to Caitlin, lovely Caitlin, who speaks truth to power. Um, so across child protection and child and family services workforces, we need that big cultural shift, but strong, persistent and sustained leadership from our CEOs and significant leadership from within the department will be what it needs. Centralised and coordinated oversight so that we do what we say and we say what we do is going to be critical um, in getting this to happen. And when we talk about collaboration and partnership between ACOs, agencies and the department, they're not, you know, that's just not about words. That's about deep, deep understanding of each other and sustained um, collaboration. Agencies and ACOs are excited about the impact we know we can have on the over-representation of Aboriginal families by working together. Um, some of the work that's already going on is incredible. We need more of it and we need to grow the capacity to do that across this great state of Victoria. It also needs investment in both the sector and the department to support transition implementation. We talk about these things as if they're easy, they're not. Um, in terms of doing these things properly and correctly and knowing we've done them. We know there's a strong foundation of this at the centre where I work, uh, where we've got the Outcomes Evidence Practice Network, we've got um, our sector capability framework, and we've also got an industry plan. But we also have work happening in VACA around the developing of Aboriginal practice. So we've got the right settings. Um, we, we're ready to go. We just need the money because uh, I think we've got the will. Thanks, Michael. Sorry, I had, a, I had a little trouble with my mute button again. My apologies. Uh, thanks very much, Deb. I think there was a, there was a lot in that response and a, and a lot of really um, important, um, I, I think, comments and observations that uh, could be unpacked uh, in, a, in a session uh, it's, itself. Um, I want to. Um, I want to be. I want to go back to the um, the the panel generally around what they think are the the broader effort element. Sorry, broader benefits of early intervention. And I and I'd like to go back to uh, Caitlin first, if we if we don't mind. Um, and Caitlin, in responding to that question, if you if you do want to talk about um, co-design. Um, please do. You mentioned it briefly in your um, uh, in your your answer to the previous question. I think when we when we talk about self determination driving the responses uh, for Aboriginal uh, young people, I think you know co design has to drive the responses for all young people. Um, can I can I hand over to you, Caitlin? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Michael. Um, so given the work that we've done within Y Change, we've seen um, almost 
instant results. Uh, it, they're not haven't they haven't been instant, so to speak, in terms of delivering. But we see some sort of positive change, and you can't possibly talk about an issue that affects young people directly without including young people. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and that's what I really love about Why Change. We have different kinds of young people with different sorts of experiences. Um, we all don't have the same voice, um, and that's where I think quality or qualitative data and quantitative data comes out of the discussions that we have. And it's good that we don't have the same reasoning or the same approach to things, because that's how we come up with a really well thought out and well planned um, project, or we come up with great advice for Michael when he wants something. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and even just the reports that we've made, they've had really great feedback. Um, and I think we, we've definitely set the standard for, um, you know, what young people can achieve. And we're, not, we're more than just our stories. And we can be contributing members to society. We're not just, you know, people who've been through care, you know, we have jobs where people, you know, um, so I think the broader benefits are that, you know, we, we definitely will see some change um, if you include young people who have lived the system. They can tell you what goes wrong. You don't have to, you know, waste money or resources on figuring out where we can tell you where. Um, so you have that direct link um, with people who have lived experience and co-designing with them as well. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Great point. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, and uh, I I'm, should say the Why Change team are an amazing source of advice for me. We're, we're really at Berry Street, um, you know, we're getting to the point where we don't make big decisions without consulting Why Change, and it's fantastic to have their expertise at the table. Um, Muriel, what do you think of the broader benefits of, the early, of uh, early intervention? Okay, we might be having some technical difficulties. So what about we go to... How about if I unmute myself? <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, sorry. Uh, like last week, um, you know, when we think about what's going to change in early intervention and prevention, but I think we're going to be challenged very shortly. Last week, we launched the Close the Gap um, the National Partnership Agreement. And in that agreement, we've committed to reduce the numbers of Aboriginal children in care by 45% in the next 10 years. But some of the things that we've been able to negotiate under that are around institutional systemic change, around greater investment in Aboriginal community control and a monitoring and accountability. So I think um, there's a real opportunity to look at early intervention and prevention. And I, I know that um, when we look at the current data, less than 50% of Aboriginal families access family support and early intervention services. And so I think that some of these things are going to have to change. And I think that um, having a reform agenda and having Australia commit to close the gap on Aboriginal is going to be critical. But I think that an investment in Aboriginal community control has to happen. Um, I did the, you know, an inquiry into the Northern Territory Child Protection System and what we saw was 83 services fly in a month to Tiwi Island. So what we've got is a you know, do-for approach for Aboriginal people flying in on planes and delivering justice, education, all of those programs. I think our people are tired of being the recipients of a service system and we want to actually drive change. And we can't be sitting on the fence blaming government and everybody else for things that need to happen. So I think to take charge of parenting programs, early intervention, working better with our young people to get and our children and to make sure that we keep our families out of the out of systems because the system doesn't treat us equally or, or justly. And so I think the best thing to do is to keep us out of those systems. Great point. And I think to take that control, you need you need to be given that license by by government, and I think um, uh, the self-determination agenda in Victoria, I think, sets up the framework to do that. I, I think it's a matter of... Yeah, uh, sure I'd probably um, argue a little bit with you, Michael, there. It needs as well mainstream commitment, and I think okay. the commitment of Berry Street, McKillop, Angley Care, you know, Uniting, and other mainstream organisations, VCOS and others, to say, stop taking the money off Aboriginal and start to sort of really give back and, and give back the power. So I think Berry Street, the Centre of Excellence and all of those for their commitment 
to, you know, beyond good intentions and transferring resources back to Aboriginal. Yeah, great. Well said. Thanks, Mira. Deb, do you want to have a final comment? Um, look, I, I think that um, this, this piece of work, um, you know, Michael and I, this is the second iteration. Um, this piece of work is, uh, the timing couldn't be better because actually uh, Victorian young people, children and families are gonna dig us out of this. Uh, and so this report isn't just about children out of home care or families that are struggling, it's about how we can see a future. Uh, and, and as Caitlin said, you know, uh, young people know what's gonna work. So for me, um, I think people need to see this as a piece of work that's going to uh, take us beyond the fear. I mean, we are all quite afraid of that, what, what, what we're looking at in the next few months. This report gives us a roadmap. Certainly, I think that um, the work that we've done around the use of evidence, uh, I want to repeat that, you know, the centre uh, and VACA are, are really interested in uh, evidence-based models, evidence-informed models, common elements and documenting Aboriginal practice. So this is a broad church. Uh, and so we're on that, we're on that journey. This report tells you that if you do that, if you use evidence, you get outcomes. Uh, so I think that um, uh, the sector's putting its money where its mouth is in terms of what we think is going to work and we're ready to go. So all we need now is for the government to, uh, to give us the green light, give us the money, uh, and we are going to work together to make this happen. Thanks, Deb. <clears throat> and uh, please join me in thanking all the panellists for their comments. Uh, Deb, who's on the screen now, uh, our wonderful leader, uh, Muriel Bamblett, uh, and uh, Caitlin sharing her lived experience in such an articulate uh, and, um, and powerful way. Thank you to all of you. I, I don't know how one claps in a webinar, um, but uh, I'm sure people are cl uh, clapping. Um, 2000, uh, I, I think that's fair to say, the bushfires and now COVID have made it a year that's really turned uh, normal on its head. And we're all having to learn to cope in new and different ways. And, and it's tough. I'm certainly finding it tough. Uh, and what we've heard today demonstrates that without COVID or without the bushfires, there were going to be a group of children and families who were going to have a terrible 2020, no matter what. And if COVID is making it worse, uh, and COVID is um, going to increase the numbers of children coming into the system uh, and it's going to increase the, uh, make the impact on uh, families worse. And I, I want to finish with a few observations. I think firstly, Victoria's child protection system is broken uh, and it is punitive and racist in nature. And I think this is evidenced by the way children are pushed around the system and that there are 10, 20, uh, 30 different placements um, that, that people can, um, uh, that young people can experience. The poor health, education, and social outcomes of young people leaving care. The lack of regard for the future of the families and the children who the child protection system is in contact with. And once again, the over-representation of Aboriginal children and, and young people. That really powerful statistic Less than 1% of the population in Victoria, Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander, yet 26% are in care. The system really has two responses. It's about removing children or leaving children with their families. And life isn't binary. Uh, and our system for keeping children safe can't be binary either. Um, you know, Berry Street, has been around for 140 years. We're part of the system and we're part of the broken system and we're, we recognise that. Um, and we also recognise that we can't bear witness to the devastating impacts of that system and say nothing, uh, despite the consequences of doing so. And recovery from COVID 
needs to be seen in the context of social recovery and it needs to be seen in the context of economic recovery and early intervention addresses both. both. This report shows that you can keep 15,000 children out of care over a decade and at the same time save government $2 billion. The alternative is to do nothing, go with the status quo and see 27,500 kids in care by 2026 and spend more, more than $2 billion extra than you have to. When it comes down to that, it's a pretty easy choice. Thank you again to our participants, uh, sorry, to our presenters. I want to thank Leanne Roberts, our Head of Public Policy at Berry Street, Emma Fembi, who came up with the idea to do this COVID-specific report, uh, to Oliver uh, and the team at the centre who organised the event. To get a copy of the report, please visit the Berry Street website or the website uh, for the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare. Thanks very much, everyone, and let's intervene earlier.